Antidepressants weren't working. We'd been to every single therapist and nothing was touching it until we used he, him pronouns. I don't even know where to start here. Sex is not assigned at birth, it's established at conception. We have to get to biology here. Today we're bringing a new version of Middle Ground. We'll be exploring the topic, should minors be allowed to medically transition? We'll be introducing an undecided group and they'll be listening to a discussion between liberals and conservatives and the undecided group will pick a side after each prompt. Transitioning has become a social media trend. Absolutely agree. I mean, it is just skyrocketing the amount of children that you see falling into this and we need to stop it. Absolutely not. People said the same thing about people coming out being lesbian, gay, or bisexual as it got more normalized, as people became more accepting of like their children and things like that. They're like, everybody wants to be gay. Now social media is around, people my age, like we see other trans people and being aware that that's something that's being accepted by other people makes you more comfortable with yourself and like comfortable with like internalizing that it's okay to be trans in public. I think you're falling prey to the survivorship bias, which is just sort of, you're overlooking all of the cases of people who either weren't able to come out because they weren't comfortable or safe to do so, or they either died due to suicide or other mental health reasons. But over time, if you look at left-handedness, that skyrocketed in a similar rate as people became more accepting to it. Well, I, I, challenge, I, I reject that, but... Let me, let me ask you something. If that's the case, if more people are transitioning simply because it's more acceptable, mm -hmm. then how can your side also say that there's a trans genocide happening? Those are c completely I didn't opposite. Say that. No, I know you didn't, but you're but the people but liberals say that all the time. I They're didn't. saying that there's a trans genocide because of, for some reason. So I'm just curious as to how you would square that circle. Can we define what the trans genocide, I guess, narrative is as raised by her? I would like her to answer that because she's the one that brought it up. Yeah, because so we hear people saying because simply because because legislation is being passed across the country that is banning minors from being able to transition, that automatically means that those children would commit suicide. And that is simply an abusive statement in of itself. Statistically, a lot of minors who aren't able to transition who would like to do end up. Why don't we have this why don't we have this why don't we have the same suicide rates in the past? That we that were that if if that was the case. How Let's could we from. how could we have known that the people who were committing suicide were transgender if they didn't feel safe to come out? When you look at like um, members of each generation that identify as LGBTQ or in that community, it's like less than two percent. And then for some reason, as soon as we get to Generation Z, it's twenty percent. Now, some of you may argue, okay, this is just because it's more open, it's more accepting now. Everyone, it's okay to be that. But then in the same beat, you guys will say that if you don't accept them, they're more likely to commit suicide or something. But it kind of sounds like a double-edged sword. So that didn't sound double-edged to me. It, it sounded pretty accurate. Like if you're not accepting of somebody, they're more likely to be self-hating. Like if you're telling somebody that they're not allowed to do something, they shouldn't do something, they're not fitting into their own body, especially experiencing dysphoria in itself. It, it, it's a mental battle in general. Like. So, okay. so to clarify your point, I think you're saying that acceptance is what's leading to it. Is that right? It, it's a, a mixture between self-acceptance, outer acceptance. It's a conversation between nature and nurture. Like, See, it, here's the problem with that. There have been two, there's two longitudinal studies alone that I could cite. In Sweden, from 1973 to 2003, they looked at a large number of subjects who had before transition and after transition, and they had m worse comorbidities. They had worse mental health issues. Sweden is a very tolerant, liberal, progressive country. A study this year, published in Denmark, 2023, 42-year longitudinal, longitudinal study, and what they found is that the mental health issues did not decline, they actually were augmented. It was worse for individuals who thought that by transitioning they would solve their mental health issues, it actually got worse. It doesn't help, it doesn't solve these issues, it shows it's a contagion, that is the key word. Let's, let's pause there then. What are your guys' thoughts on, let's say, maybe that's a pretty popular figure that's been mentioned when it comes to a social media influencer that has risen to fame because of that. She's just doing what she's doing. I don't think that she's doing anything wrong. Okay, he. Do you think that has... My pronouns are she, her. That's transphobic. Do you think, he. Do you think that has inspired uh, trans kids? I think she's also inspired allies to see the human being behind the pronouns and the makeup and the dress and to see that there's someone who is going through a story and that watching her go through that story enabled us to see the humanity behind her. He is degrading she women. You see a great disregard. I mean, look at the look at the product that he was supposed to be promoting. It has fallen into. Her so, pronouns um, are she, and, and with all due respect, to me, it like isn't the phobic to speak the truth. Or not the youth. Okay. That's not a phobia. <laughs> Let's talk here. Is not a phobia. Let's stop here and let's uh, go over to the undecided group.
All right, so undecided group. You guys are kind of like the common section. Which side did you resonate with most? Liberals or conservatives? So why did you resonate most with the liberal group? Trends pass. Mm. Trends end. So calling it a trend is saying that these people's identities are just going to go away. And I don't think that's fair. Why do you think that it's not transphobic to misgender because the concept of misgendering is false. There are two sexes, there's male and female. Well, it's, it's, it's in the chromosomes. It goes beyond superficial or secondary characteristics. He is a male. He was born a male, he will remain a male. It doesn't matter how many chemicals he puts into his body or how many body parts are cut off. And I'll say this again, telling the truth is not a mental illness. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, um, I think that there is a difference between sex and gender, and I know you're gonna disagree with me, but transgender is its own thing and he can, she can be See, no, don't try to blame that on me. You are using the wrong pronouns for this woman and you're trying to no. influence something. Do you have I'm a just, specific question that truth. you like to ask the liberal group? I would just like to hear more from them because I feel like it was very one-sided. Thank you. Okay. So you sat more on the conservative side. Do you want to explain why you decided to come here? Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, there are, I mean, it is just factual that there are more people transitioning or at least coming out, not even just as transgender, but just, you know, within the LGBTQ community as a whole. And so I do see, you know, I think for me, it does become a little bit grayer when you start to say, okay, is that because people are being like influenced to transition or is it because it's more accepting and people are feeling more open and safe about coming out? And I think, you know, when you're in, you know, a friend group or when you, you know, associate with certain people, I think you are likelier to maybe, you know, explore your gender a little bit more or, you know, look more into those avenues. And I think that can influence someone to transition if, you know, maybe beforehand that wouldn't have been a consideration. Do you have a specific question that you'd like to ask either side? Yeah, I guess I would like to ask, you know, the liberal side, you know, and I can't necessarily trace it back to a specific time when this happened, but I do think we have seen recently, you know, a rise in people identifying with genders that aren't necessarily within a binary. Would you say that's a rise? You know, how would you, I guess, account for that? I think, as I said earlier, that is just accounted by survivorship bias. People previously were not comfortable enough with coming out, and that's where that difference comes from. And eventually, that skyrocketing rate will even out. Um, I definitely do think that that is kind of a factor of it, that, I mean, you know, people are just coming out more and are feeling more accepted. And I absolutely do believe that, you know, that is a good that social media has done. But I do also kind of push back on the idea that it's just completely that. Like, I, you know, when you look at figures who, you know, rise to prominence, like, for example, D D um, Dylan Mulvaney, you know, these are people with huge platforms that, you know, are reaching to, you know, younger people who are at stages in their lives where, you know, they are exploring ideas of gender and gender expression and identity. And so I guess personally, I would push back a little bit against the idea that it's just people who had it been more accepting in the past, they would have come out. I do think there is, you know, a rise. I mean, I feel like the numbers just don't really account for it necessarily being just that group of people. I think there are people, especially youth, who are identifying more kind of on the gender spectrum or as transgender that maybe wouldn't have before. So, you're the only undecided. Can you clarify why you still remain undecided? Um, yeah, I think the reason I remained undecided was because although I appreciate um, the presentations of both sides and I see both of their points, I was still a little bit unclear um, as far as which what like, each opinion was on each side. So, um, I would just be curious to ask the liberal side, do you guys, is there any like evidence that you guys could present that would suggest um, that transitioning lowers the rate of suicide? I would say on one hand, there, there is data that suggests that um, trans minors who are not able to medically transition when they do want to, their suicidality um, attempt rate is around 40%, and that drops to below 10% when they are able to transition. Moreover, if I wouldn't, wasn't able to transition and I didn't have any support in my life, I would probably kill myself. The conservatives, uh, you guys were discussing social media contagion. Could you present any other like arena as far as um, other instances where we've seen social media have that influence on? I'd youth? love to add just every aspect of mainstream media. So um, CNN, like all mainstream news sources, um, when we talk about even like major corporations, we have Pride Month for God's sake, right? We have an entire month where all corporations, all major corporations, even the government, you know, President Joe Biden is putting a pride flag. It seems like. Every aspect of our like top dog, like 
main people in society are promoting it, right? And then if you go down to like social media, um, everyone's promoting it, right? Each Instagram, or not, maybe not Twitter anymore, or X now, but TikTok, there's, there's trends, there's um, things that are happening where it is being promoted. And the fact that there's influencers, I think is just proving the fact that it is indeed a trend. Gender dysphoria is a mental illness. It is a break with reality. I'll start at where I've said before, there are two sexes. It's determined not just by external characteristics, but by chromosomes. When somebody dies and is buried, and 400 years later, if they exhume the body and they test those bones, they're going to see that it's an XX or an XY, it's a male or a female. It's a mental issue, and you want to treat it that way. You treat it with counseling, with therapy, reflecting reality, helping the person be a, to be comfortable with the sex that they're born with, sex. What do you guys think about that? Um, uh, it's calling it a mental illness. Yes, yeah, so I want to respond to your comment about bones and skeletal. I study bio um, anthropology, and actually they're moving in a direction where they're using terminology like assumed or, or estimated gender because there is large um, overlap between the general sort of uh, estimations. Also, no one's going to dig up someone's bones unless they've already consented to donating their skeleton somewhere. No one just goes gra grave robbing for that. But that's, that's, well, it, that's let's, irrelevant. Let's hear, let's hear well, a little bit. The point is... It's irrelevant to bring it up then. No, 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 it is relevant to point out that sex is determined at birth and it doesn't change. But what's the point you're making with the skeleton example? The point that it doesn't change even over long periods of time. I'd like to Thank hear you. a little bit more from Thank you for your both of you. If you, you're walking around life constantly being told something like what you're supposed to identify as and you feel other than, like of course, as time goes on, you're gonna feel worse and worse about that specific thing. I don't think there's a reason to transition if you don't have a mental illness. Like, there's something wrong in That's your like brain. That's like saying you that, shouldn't cut no. your hair because you don't no. want long hair. Wow, anymore. that is so not a comparison. No. So, so when, when, wow. when, when you, when you I mean, when, when I, when, it's, it's the opposite concept of gender or body dysmorphia. So when you look in the mirror and you see what's wrong with, like you see, you have an uncomfortability with your secondary sex characteristics. And so the treatment is to change that to m match with what you, what you want it to be. But I mean, he's right, you can't change your sex, but it's in the brain. You treat the body to help the brain. It's not any different. And, and honestly, I'm somebody who, I don't think you should be, we should stigmatize mental illness. That's the whole point is, you know, I have anxiety, PTSD from when I was in the military and everything else. I don't think we should be stigmatizing mental illnesses. And so I think that calling it for what it is, is just accepting that. And it actually helps with treatment and to what you're treating, because you're treating the brain. You have to go to a therapist, you have to go all of that. So I, I think it's no issue to call it. I think- And I when think you treat the brain, you don't cut the body though. I mean, if somebody has bulimia or anorexia, you treat the reason why they perceive themselves incorrectly. Right. If somebody has dysmorphia, you don't say, well, just cut off a body part. But this that? is a complete violation of the Hippocratic Oath. Gender dysphoria is a mental health condition and the treatment for this condition is to do a medical transition if that person chooses to have those procedures done. It won't go away with just a simple pill. It's gender dysphoria. It has nothing to do with sex and bones and, and your DNA. Do you think children are capable of making that decision? Let me, let me pose a question. Homosexuality actually used to be considered as a mental illness. Do you think there's any correlation here with what's going on currently with the trans movement? It, it has to do with the way you present yourself. And again, I, I call it sex dysphoria because it's dysphoria of your sex, but it has to do with your secondary sex characteristics that you're presenting to society. You know, in a lot of regards, and even Deborah So wrote this in End of Gender, she, she actually advocated for this because the same hormone imbalance in the womb that causes more, you know, femininity and homosexuality seems to be very similarly tied to gender dysphoria as well. It's just a, it's, it's a further step along the way. It's a further, you know, condition. And, and I, I agree where I use, I guess I use mental illness and mental health condition synonymously, essentially. So I think what's interesting about this topic is that, you know, we need to consider both statistics as well as personal anecdotes. If you guys don't mind, do you want to share a little bit about your personal experiences with this particular topic? Yeah, so I actually, I didn't even know that trans people existed until I was around like 19, I think. I just, that information never came to me. Um, I'm 25 right now. I didn't really realize I was trans until I was 22. And I started medically transitioning when I was 23. I've, I've experienced depression for most of my life, probably since I was like 13 or so. And um, a lot of suicidal ideation throughout high school and early in college. But pretty much around the time I had, I guess, felt comfortable with my, like where I'd gone in transitioning, that had largely decreased pretty much entirely. And this is, and this is what's interesting because I know when we talk about a lot of this stuff, um, every transsexual that I know that transit, that 
you know, we started feeling dysphoria around the very time that we became self-aware, around the age of four years old. Um, but yeah, I mean, I knew around the age of four that there was something different. I wanted to be the opposite sex. I knew I wasn't the opposite sex, but it was something that I wished, you know, I could. I knew that there was something different. Um, and, you know, I tried to dress on at four years old and went from there and then transitioned later in life when, um, you know, I finally accepted it myself. I'd be curious to hear your perspective as someone, I think you mentioned that you have kids that yes. have transitioned. Yes, I have that magical uterus. My, 11, my third child came out at 11 and told us that he was a boy. He was assigned female at birth. And so he socially transitioned, obviously, because he was only 11. Uh, he is now an 18-year-old college university student and thriving. Um, and then my uh, youngest child came out as a trans girl at the age of 15. So um, I live this with my children. Um, I made the trek to the emergency room with suicide, um, a suicide attempt and a suicide plan with each of my children. Did at any point, did your opinion on this is a gender dysphoria or, or a mental illness change as you know, you've had actual kids that has transitioned? My opinion hasn't changed. It's a mental health condition but antidepressants weren't working. We, before uh, Mitchell came out, we tried everything. We'd been to every single therapist and nothing was touching it until we used he, him pronouns. And that was all it took to make things better for him initially. And then we did the medical transition. You know, I don't even know where to start here. It's like sex, again, sex is not assigned at birth. It's established at conception. We have to get to biology here. And the second thing is we're seeing like this move. I mean, you were mentioning the academic setting. Notice how the, the academic terms are changing, but this is a result of pressure. This is a result of societal pressure. It's That's science. what happened with homosexuality, by the way. Homosexuality is recognized as unhealthy behaviors. Now, whether you call it a mental illness or uh, a deviant behavior or destructive behavior, that's a, that's a point of debate. It's an unhealthy behavior for sure. And certainly it's the case with transgenderism, somebody cutting off healthy body parts. We have seen numerous detransitioners now coming forward they had severe health and mental problems like the ones that you've talked about but we find we find that psych I have a friend Kevin Kevin Wett he's an outspoken activist he's been on been on commercials to protect children from sex mutilation he was abused as a kid he was he was beaten by his dad he was molested by older kids when he was in school he struggled with identity issues these are horrific traumas that he endured and not once okay. did a counselor ever address those deeper issues that's what needs to be happening now let's actually hear from the undecided group so on the side of group, which side do you resonate with more? So why did you choose the liberal side? I do think it's a mental health condition. I, I don't like calling it an illness. Everyone has things they don't like about their bodies. I don't think we're calling everyone mentally ill. It's interesting how you brought up conce conception and saying that gender is decided at conception because- Sex is the term, that's what I said, not gender. I said sex. Sex, sorry. Sex is decided at conception because... Established. Established, okay. It's Someone very close to me is trans, and so hearing it from people who identify as trans themselves, you can talk about statistics and facts all day, but if you actually listen to people and what they're going through and their experience, I feel like it's just much deeper. You were on the undecided in the previous prompt, but now it seems like you went on the conservative side. What changed and what arguments spoke to you most? To my knowledge, the American Psychological Association still categorizes gender dysphoria as a mental illness. So just to stay on the side of facts um, and at this time what the experts are categorizing it as, I'm going to obviously side with that side. I feel like science is always changing its definitions, oh, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we yeah. used to drill heads and sides to fix migraines. Um, I'm curious if that will change your mind if that classification was taken away. Well, to my knowledge, I think the American Psychological Association does intend to uh, later categorize it under neurodivergence rather than mental like illness, but it's also something that needs to be treated. When people with gender dysphoria go in to um, get the diagnosis, they do have to go to a psychologist and get um, a prescription and this sort of stuff, so it's part of the process. So just, I understand that science is constantly an evolving field of study, but as to what we know now, I think I'd rather just stay safe and stay with them. With the vaccine. Do you feel like if they are to medically transition that they need to go through a series or rounds of different psychiatric tests? Well, in the, in, um, in the case of children, I think that would be necessary just because this is, I know 
in some cases it can be reversible, but this is a life-changing decision. So you brought up the word life-changing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's any question that you'd like to ask either side, because that seems to be the big stipulation in this kind of debate here. Um, well, I guess I would like to ask the liberals, did you see in your own lives, like vast improvements? Like what did that look like, the vast improvements that you saw? Uh, my mental health was just largely improved. I was having a much easier time, I guess, making friends because I was more confident in my own identity. My children's lives changed completely. It was like turning on a light switch. They brightened, they were more social. They uh, excelled in school again after failing. Um, they just completely transformed their lives. Yeah, that's very interesting. You were on the conservative side and now you're back on the side. You guys flip-flopped here. What's something that kind of brought you back into the middle here? Yeah, I would say, I guess, my main reason for being here is that I just am unclear as to, like, I guess the difference between something being a mental illness or mental condition. I, I know some people in the conversation said that they use them interchangeably. Some people said that they prefer to use the term mental condition rather than illness. Um, you know, I guess what kind of differentiates those things, if anything? Well, I think you just hit the nail on the head there. Changing the name of something doesn't doesn't change the fundamental reality that it, it, there's, a, there's a problem, there's a mental health issue that the person has. It's a disorder, it's a, it's a break from reality. That's just a fact. The person is born male or female and thinks that they should be something else. Now, regardless of how that one treats that, the fact is, and I, I would submit even from the, the comments from the liberal side, they recognize that it's an illness that needs to be treated. I recognize that the, it needs treating, but it's not a break from reality. That's yes, a psychosis. Is. A psychosis you, is a break from reality. A psychosis is a break from reality. Which is a mental illness. Gender dysphoria is not a psychosis. But it is a break from reality because the person thinks they should be something else. I think it's pretty clear. It's a disconnect between reality. You've, you're born male, you're born female, but then your brain is saying something else. The cool thing about this entire debate is that liberals for once agree that there's possibly a soul, right? They say, you know, I was born male or female, but something deep down, something in me is I'm actually this. I'm actually this. Did that reality help? is what is physical. And so if you are physically or biologically male or female, you don't need to change your body. You need to change what you're thinking. Okay, let's go back to the undecided. Yeah. Did that help clarify or is there any additional questions that bring up? Um, I guess it kind of did. You know, when I think of like a mental illness, it is something that like we treat. And so I guess in that regard, I would, I don't know if it's necessarily a position. I mean, I feel like, you know, we do talk about, you know, people who are diagnosed with gender dysphoria, like you treat that with some, I think in many cases, I don't know if it's all the time. I'm sure it's not all the time. But in the majority of the cases, you treat that with some kind of transition, whether it's a medical or a social or both. And so, I mean, I see kind of that definition. I feel like, but I mean, my takeaway is that I feel like they both kind of agree with that. And I don't know necessarily that, I think it's a politically charged definition. I think it's like obviously how you interpret it and like what is treatment, what is proper treatment, you know, what is included within an, a mental illness, what isn't. But I guess my takeaway I think is like, I think we, or at least the conversation, the people in the conversation, I think they agree a lot more on kind of the general topic itself than maybe they might realize. Um, but of course, when you get to nitty gritty, I think there's, that's where you get the division. The medical community is pushing gender transitions for financial gain. So I disagree. Um, I mean, when I was started, started going through my process of transitioning, I didn't feel pushed by any medical professional at all. There were, in fact, quite the opposite, a lot of hurdles and just like bureaucratic red tape sections I had to like work through. But it's, it's not something that I think, in my experience, was pushed onto me, at least. Yeah, I completely agree with that. When I started my transition, it took over a year just for me to get to my third doctor's appointment for us to actually like talk and evaluate things. And as far as cost goes, my insurance covered everything. But they're, they're, they are still getting paid. Just the government or somebody else is paying them. I mean, in comparison to a BBL, yeah, like, yeah. Well, yeah, so, so here, but yeah, but they're still getting paid and they're still getting financial. I actually think there's three different types of doctors. I think that there are people that are going out there and doing it for financial gain. We saw it in Vanderbilt. We saw it in so many other instances where they are doing it. We also see that they are manipulating the system. That's why we have a lot of detransitioners right now, and, and that's why we're seeing that, that, gr that community grow is because they're manipulating patients, they're ma manipulating parents. And so this, the, other, the third is, I don't know if it's ineptitude or if it's um, incompetence or laziness, but I think that there is a section, there's a, there's a group of mental health providers who simply right now, we want to cure everything with a pill. 
And so we see this not only in the trans community, but we see this in the SSRI community. We see this, everybody's being put onto something and we're not really treating the root causes. It's one of the reasons why we're seeing a high comorbidity of like autism in the community. A lot of people that have autism are getting sucked into this and they're not being treated for the autism, they're treating for gender dysphoria. So one thing to uh, consider, and I did research on this, is that apparently based of, on top or bottom surgeries, it can actually range from around ten to $25,000 uh, from male to female transitions to female to male transitions. And I think you know, what both sides can probably agree on is that America is a for-profit healthcare industry, right? right? We don't yeah. have universal healthcare. Yeah, and, and anything to consider there. So, so yeah. with the oh, with socialized the, medicine, with the, with the Vanderbilt situation, she actually said because of Obamacare, they have to pay for it, and so they they are forcing mm -hmm. insurance companies to pay for it. So it became a big money maker. Was her specific phrase that she said? I just want to remind everyone that there are international standards of care, and there are many countries out there that have social medicine, and it's not all for profit. Argentina and Denmark apparently are one of the two countries that has included, I believe, transitioning for minors in their private and public health care plans. I, I'd but, like to comment, but I want to give you a chance first. Um, no, it's, it's kind of hard to draw intentions completely um, with these kinds of things. I, I completely agree with you that America is a for-profit uh, country. And so regardless of what trend or what surgery is getting popular, they're going to find a way to make money out of it. Yeah, America is a for-profit and everything, but an EpiPen costs a whole lot more than testosterone does. So even with mm -hmm. that, and we're uh, once again the push for being trans in medical societies as far as our experience go goes doesn't really exist because two people here are saying that you know it was quite the opposite it took significantly longer for anything to happen significantly longer to try to do anything significantly longer than you know as far as like cosmetic surgeries or anything like that goes so. but I, I, need to, I need to okay. i need to point out big pharma makes big money off of butchering little boys and girls there is big money to be made in this. Follow the money. Ted Hidako, he's a father who's been fighting very hard because he's in a fraught divorce. His son was being put through the transitions. He saw in his medical bills $200,000 for the chemical treatments alone. We could talk about the Jeff Younger situation. Jeff is trying to fight to save his son. Now his ex-wife has taken the son here to transition him to try to become a girl, not only are the medical costs being put upon him, but also legal costs. So to your point though, so what we saw out of the whistleblower out of St. St. Louis, who is a self-identified queer woman who's married to a trans man, and she blew the whistle on what's going on there. Now where I hear a lot of adults um, in this situation say that it was a long process for you, um, that's not what we're hearing from detransitioners and a lot of these patients, and that's not what the St. Louis whistleblower said. She said they were basically pencil whipping um, uh, psychologist, psychologist letters so that they could start Myers on transition, and that's one of the reasons why I think that that clinic is also closing. I mean, once again, for me, it's I'm always going to go on personal experience before I go on stats because there are too many trans people specifically who don't get accounted into those statistics. So it's hard for me to be like, yes, this number and yes, this number. I'm, yeah. you know, whatever, but for me, it's like, it took a year and a half of therapy for me and my therapist, who was also trans, to go through that process and write that out for me yeah. to be comfortable or me to be, you know, whatever it may be to get what I needed. So it, on top of that, the money situation, there's so many trans people who can't afford to transition, whether they're on insurance or not. So for me- Other to, people are paying for it. What other the government, people? government, <laughs> Medicare, Medicaid. My goodness, right. this was well, a discussion in Wyoming. Let's stop it here, here and we'll ask the other side of the group. Okay, on the side of group, let's hear about which side that you resonate with more, liberals or conservative. You started off in the undecided, then conservative, and now the liberal. Yeah. You've been all across the spectrum. Yeah, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear about what kind of resonated with you more to switch sides this time. I'm sure and confident that there are practitioners out there who are pushing people to transition, who are just signing off on prescriptions. Because yes, I mean, you know, like the points were made, that there is money to be made, of course. But I don't know that I'd go as far as to say, you know, that there is this, like, I think someone mentioned it on the liberal side, that there's like a conspiracy going on. I don't mm. think that's the case. I think, again, there are absolutely predatory, you know, practitioners and maybe even large organizations who are looking to profit off of, you know, the medical transitioning process. Um, but, you know, I think someone mentioned you know, the aspect of personal experiences and how for many trans people, it's extremely expensive. And even if you are on some kind of insurance or even if you are on some kind of plan, it can still, you know, the cost can, you know, mount up a lot. Yeah, that's interesting too, because I guess in any movement, right, there are gonna be people that take advantage about it for their own selfish gains. Mm -hmm. How much money is, I guess, there to be made 
in so the transition that's, that's process? A, that's, a, that's a hard question to answer, right? Because no. you're creating a medical patient for life. Mm -hmm. So it's over the course of a person's lifetime that they would be buying hormones and all this. You're, it's not accurate. Is, you have to take hormones. Trans person they, they have to, hormones. Let's, let's, let's let her speak. Let's let her speak. No, let's let her speak. Well, let's let her speak. Yeah. That's in, that's let's let her speak. So, so, so you're right. I mean, there are a lot of people that may come off. It's not. It's more so on the uh, trans man side than the trans woman side, where you have to be on hormones forever, otherwise it comes back. And if you have your sec if you have your primary sex organs removed as well. Um, so that's that's kind of a hard question to answer. What it is over the course of a lifetime, I think they've estimated up to a hundred thousand to two hundred thousand. But like one surgery, so like a vaginoplasty cost about thirty to twenty to twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars. I think the uh, the phallioplasty costs more, um, and then you get, go down a little bit with uh, top surgeries and stuff like that. But it's still a thousands of dollars, you know, at least, I mean, a breast augmentation is about $10,000. I've had children have surgeries and medication for various illnesses, and I always find the way to pay for it. And I found the way to pay for what needed in this case. How much did it cost? What was the general range? I'm not comfortable sharing that. Okay. Um, I can say that for me, I, I pay about like $10 every like four months for my medication and yeah that's pretty much it so you've been kind of consistent throughout in each of these prompts of staying on the liberal side yeah is there anything that you might want to ask that may potentially maybe even sway you to the other side or just something maybe that you're not considering my cousin is trans and he is so important to me and so saying that it's a, it's a mental illness saying that it's pushing when you can see that so many trans people of color are being denied treatment. I just, I don't think that that's fair to say that it's pushing. I just, I feel like it would, it would, I would be disrespecting someone very close to me if I was over there and saying that it's a mental illness and then they're pushing transitioning just so they can make money. Okay, so you're back on the undecided. What, what made you stay here? It's a bit dangerous to generalize or demonize the medical community and state that there's like a wide contingent or conspiracy trying to push um, transitioning, especially if we don't have evidence of it. I think there's probably, like um, he was saying, evidence of predatory practitioners and that sort of thing. If it brings them sort of some sort of financial benefit, we do have to question whether their motives are entirely pure, but that could be true of like any disease. So it's, it's kind of both sides, I think, had good points and both um, were kind of right. So I'm, I'm not in the middle because I can't make a decision. I'm more in the middle because I agree with them both. Schools should include trans conversation in sex ed. An age appropriate time, I agree, yes. What is that age appropriate? I think by grades three or four, they understand. So what is that, like around eight, nine, or? I don't know anymore, <laughs> my <laughs> kids are too old. But that sounds about right. I think eight or nine years old is a good time because gender is a concept that is formed in the mind of a child around the ages of two, three, or four years old. By the time they're seven or eight, they understand the permanency of gender. So I think that's a good time to introduce it. Now, should they be talked about as just as much as, let's say, heterosexual sex, or sh more in, in terms of including different historical relevancy, anything like that? I think it would be great to introduce the difference between gender expression, gender identity, and sexual orientation, mm -hmm. because that is three completely different realms and children can understand the difference between gender expression and gender identity at that age without ever having to talk about sex. Yeah, I definitely disagree. Um, I think especially what they're proposing right now, a lot of the mainstream sort of education on sex ed is pretty like vulgar. You're looking at a couple like books, you see a lot of parents going out to like city committee meetings and they're reading books in front of like the school committee and the school has to like stop the, the, in, the entire thing because they're reading such vulgar stuff. So if I had to push back on that yeah. though, kind of we've been going through like different personal experiences and some of these cases we might just be hearing about because they're the most extremist of cases. Sure. Do you think that's what's going on or do you think it's more of a common prevalent uh, instance that's happening around the country? Um, I I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a differentiation between personal experiences and just what's going on in general. And so, of course, you're going to see like the more popular cases on social media and stuff. But what it really boils down to, the question isn't really much, so much what's the content, but is it true? And it's not true. 
And so why should kids be learning about it? I mean, personally, I think that sex education should be simple biology, and then anything above that should be an opt-in system to where parents have to opt their children into that, into those, into that learning. I, I really don't think it's the responsibility of teachers to be talking to children about that. I think it really boils down to it is a parental's right to the issue, and parents make the ultimate decision how their children learn that. Um, I, I disagree only because, like, where I'm from North Carolina, and there was a point where sex ed wasn't being taught, and then there was a point where it was, and when it, they started teaching sex ed, there were children that were coming forward about like being touched inappropriate and things like that because they didn't know that those things were inappropriate parts because they hadn't been taught otherwise. So not teaching children about their bodies, about their sex, about their gender, about their expression, you're eliminating them, you're, you're giving people, pedophiles specifically, the opportunity to prey on them because they don't know any better. You're leaving yeah. them in the dark. I as far as like gender okay. is concerned, like being trans, had I learned about what trans was at an early age, I think I had a, would have had a very, a much happier life in general. Yeah. By 21, I was going into transitioning and everything like that, but I felt and knew that there was something specifically yeah. different yeah. At, by the age of like six, six, yeah. seven, without even knowing what trans was. Yeah. And had I been taught that, transitioning later on in life would have been completely different. Yeah, and like I said, at the, I think it was the very first prompt we had. I think almost every transsexual I know had that early experience, right? That's mm -hmm. happy in their transition. So I, I agree in that. I just, I, I really think it is, the parentals, it, it's parents' responsibility. The schools are supposed to pick up where the parents fall off. That's the whole point of sending your children to school. No, your parents have the right to make the decision <laughs> I, for you. Okay. I, I just want to interject right there, and that is a very U.S. way of thinking, is that parent, parental rights trump everything else, because there's a convention of children's rights worldwide, and the U.S. is the only country who hasn't signed on to it. So children in other countries have rights before their parents do. And I think that it should be taught in schools to protect the child, not just so that the parent gets to make all the rules. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the other side of the group. Which side do you guys resonate with more, liberals or conservatives? I think we have all undecided here. Uh, let's start with you, um, because this is interesting because you've always been on the liberal side until now. Mm -hmm. What spoke to you that made you undecided in this instance? Well, I would just like to mention that I actually work in childcare and I work with children. Mm. And so um, as much as I think that we should have comprehensive um, sex education, I think that five years old is a bit young. Um, I think maybe middle school age, like 10 to, high school. I don't think that um, parents should have completely all the say, mm -hmm. because if that parent is um, more on one side or the other, then they are going to push their child to do what they want them to do, and that child should be able to make that decision for themselves once they are at that age. Maybe both sides actually do accept, you know, the fact that trans individuals exist. However, more of the discrepancy is around the age and what, when it's being introduced. What yes. do you think? Yes, I, I think she mentioned around eight or nine. I think that's a good age. I have a little brother who's 11 and when he was around that age, he was able to understand that I was queer and that my cousin was trans and he was able to understand that we were we were different. Uh, I would say around eight or nine is, is probably fine in my opinion because that's generally the age in which children have a solid grasp on their own identity. And um, it's usually you know about 10 years after that maybe that they on average will disclose that. But at that age is when kids will usually figure out that they're not cis, if that's the case. Um, this lady, she started out, they started out with this concept of permanency. I just thought that was so profound undergirding the point that I've been making from the outset that sex, if you want to call it gender, is there's a permanency about it that needs to be respected. And when you're teaching little kids about transgenderism, you're automatically injecting confusion. That feeds to the very contagion that we were talking about at the outset. It breeds this confusion into children. Um, that's a real problem. I agree with the point that was made here. Um, I don't think that sex should really be pushed onto kids at all. I mean, for hundreds of years, public education didn't teach sex ed. and Things went pretty well. You didn't have all this confusion. And regarding the situation about pedophilia or otherwise, you don't need to teach a children about children about transgenderism for them to know that somebody shouldn't be touching your private parts. Did that help clarify your point? Um, you know, I did. I think you know my takeaway. I guess you know I would say I still kind of am unsure where I would stand specifically, like in terms of age ranges and you know content. But I think you know for me, I think there is kind of for me at the center of it is that conflict between 
you know, parents that don't want specific things to be talked about and then parents who just don't care at all. But at least knowing that the conversation's going on and maybe signing off on that. I know we've seen that in the past with, you know, like taking the slips home and being, you know, showing the parent if they, you know, like, we're going to take the kids into classes today and we're going to talk about this, you know, sign off if you want them to or not. However, wouldn't that kind of introduce a bit, introduce a bit of a slippery slope? What if that happens when it comes to discussions around history, around race? Do you think that could lead to parents kind of essentially shaping the worldview that may not be factually accurate? You know, when you start talking about, I guess, you know, teaching about like sex ed and let's say gender expression, sexual orientation, I think you do walk a different line between like, you know, bringing up points of history or, you know, even like the sciences. I mean, everything, you know, what you include in a curriculum, whether it's science, factual, even mathematics, like there's some kind of, you know, political basis there, whether it's super political or super apolitical. I mean, there's always going to be interest there. And so I think what's really important is, you know, curriculum transparency with parents. I think parents and students should be involved in the development of that process so that everyone at least has a say or at least can see what's being talked about at the table. You really have bounced around everywhere. So I'm curious if you wanted to ask like any specific things. Or Part of my issue, I think, with the idea of like having it mandatory at certain ages um, is that some kids, and this is why I do think parents should have the right to pull their kids out because I think some parents are, like the really involved parents do know what their kids are ready for and what they aren't. Some kids are not quite ready for those conversations. I think one thing that I heard that was a little concerning to me on the liberal side and kind of kept me here was I did hear someone, I think, say something about a parents of other cultures not being willing to. And I, I, I've lived in five countries. Mm. I've lived in two Muslim majority countries. I've lived in a Hindu, technically should be secular, but Hindu majority country. And I've lived in a Catholic country. And I think the Western mindset and how we approach issues, and we have to understand like, when you're coming out of the country and you're bringing your children into a new culture as an immigrant, you wanna keep your values at home, right? And, and there's things that you're gonna be concerned about and nervous about partially because of like religious affiliation maybe or just not experiencing it. And so if schools want those conversations to happen, the focus needs to not be going directly to the children, but it needs to be going to the parents. It needs to be prioritizing, assimilating the parents in the culture so they are aware how to have the conversations with their kids at home. Because what ultimately happens is if the child is learning something at school and they feel like they can't go home to their parents and the parents find out about it in a way that's not you know, congruent or whatever, this creates a, like a distrust from those parents with the school system and, you know, I mean, that, that just brings chaos to America. That's, that's a very serious issue. Do you think this is a uniquely American problem? I think it's a Western viewpoint problem. Minors are capable of making life-altering decisions. Yeah, absolutely disagree. There's no way. Uh, minors aren't able to make decisions whether to join the military, uh, get married, or make tattoos. And so when you're talking about something that's super important, like uh, sex, gender, whatever you want to call it, um, there's no reason we should be chopping up kids putting a bunch of hormones in them that are super dangerous that we don't, have, we don't quite know the effects of, and then completely changing the life. That's what I'm like really passionate about, especially just, I think this is like the voice, just this is the sentiment among like a lot of Americans is, you can do what you want, but why mess with the kids? And so that's where kind of I'm at. It's like, why mess with the kids? For the purpose of this discussion, we're defining minors as under 18. When you say that we don't know the effects of these chemicals and these drugs and all that, it's worth mentioning that generally speaking, all these medicines that are used were first introduced to be used to treat cis people for various things. Um, Joe Rogan, for example, takes TRT, very similar drug to what trans men take. Um, estradiol is used to treat menopause sometimes. There are people who take uh, spironolactone, which is some taken by trans femmes. People take that the same drug to treat blood pressure. Yeah, but when we're talking about minors specifically, um, it's an issue because I don't, I don't think that they have the cognitive ability to consent to long-term decisions, especially when we start to see like we talked about, we can talk about studies, like studies show that 90% wound up desisting by the age of 20. We know what puberty blockers, like puberty blockers, for example, what they do for precocious puberty, but they've never been studied and they're not FDA approved. They're prescribed off label for, for people in key growth years in adolescence. And so we're starting to see, even Marcy Bowers talked about starting somebody on puberty blockers and then going straight to cross-sex hormones and every time they're never able to fully you know, achieve orgasm as an adult. Every single person that she's ever had and she's the president of WPATH. You have to do the studies, you have to figure out and you have to put a pause button on it. Otherwise, what we're doing is literally experimenting on children. So one thing that's also important to consider too is that currently there are laws, right, when it comes to voting, uh, you know, drinking alcohol, even buying cigarettes at this point, right? I think that is something to consider in terms of this debate. We don't hold someone's hand when we go in to vote. We go in and vote on our own. When a child 
who is 16 makes a medical decision to transition, it is made with a team. There's parents, there's psychologists, there's endocrinologists. It's not just one child walking in all by themselves to do it by themselves. And we trust children to prepare our food for us at fast food restaurants. We trust children to drive combines on farmland in all 50 states. Why can't we trust a child to tell us that they are not comfortable and that we need to treat them medically with a medical transition? Because those are practices, those are jobs that, that aren't going to affect their lives forever. So that's not even, I mean, you, that, that comparison just isn't gonna work at all. You that's can the have first a thing. farm accident. Getting back, to the, getting back to this main question, children cannot commit to these life-altering decisions. They don't even know what life they can have. There are so many options that are available, available to them and they get cut short. You're making statements about how they have all these adults guiding them into this. That's the whole point. They're guiding them into getting their bodies mutilated when they should be dealing with the mental health issues. Wallace Wong is an unscrupulous medical professional in British Columbia, and he is part of the whole profit regime. They are rushing kids into these procedures. I know this because a father found out that his daughter was being transitioned without his knowledge or, without knowledge or permission. And when he was telling the public about it, he went to jail. That's what Canada does. So it's not just about big pharma making big money. It's about taking taking advantage of children that have serious problems. I'm making a personal story here. I hope you're listening. Okay, <laughs> this is like, this is horrendous stuff. These children are confused. They have mental health issues and they shouldn't be stigmatized. I wanna be very clear about that. But the answer isn't to put them under the knife or put chemicals into them that will alter them permanently. I don't necessarily believe that anybody's pushing anybody to be trans. Like when you're like, leave the kids alone. It's like, look at how you talk about trans people who would wanna be trans in that sense. Like who would want to be pushing somebody into that lifestyle to but be it treated. Is happening. Hey, let's, I'm let's sorry. Let him talk. I, let him I'm, talk. So <sighs> I'm, I'm passionate about it. I'm sorry. How many friends I've had who've been mutilated? Hey, 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 hey. Just because you might not have been able to make that at that age doesn't mean everybody that's 16 or 17 can't make that choice at that age. There's so many 16 and 17 year olds who have been emancipated, who have been, you know, not emancipated, but when they take care of themselves legally and like their own, their their own legal guardian. At that age, they're making that specific decision that I'm old enough and mature enough to make this decision for myself and my life. Like, just because you couldn't do it doesn't mean somebody else can't. Yeah, I, I just, I, to, to, to disagree, just the laws disagree with that, right? So we have laws, again, again against marriage, joining the military, um, alcohol, drugs, all these sorts of different but things. But that has nothing to do with yeah, them as let's, people. Let's, let's, yeah, but overall, um, yeah, there are laws against these things, and so we're talking about people, we're talking about a group of people who believe in Santa, right? You're seeing, you're seeing younger and younger people get uh, transitioned, right? You're talking about people with this tenuous, tenuous grip on reality. There's no reason we should be pushing sex. When I was 13, 14, I was thinking about uh, my friends, video games, sports. Let's uh, go to the undecided. Which side do you guys resonate with most? So I actually want to pick up right where we left off. How old are you? 17. Have you gone through different phases throughout your life? When I was three and four, I really wanted to be famous. I wanted to be a movie star. I wanted to be a singer. Um, when I was six to seven, I wanted to rule the world, actually, quite literally. Um, I, thought I, I thought I'd do a great job. I thought I knew everything. Um, one thing I really wanted to do, and I was really into this idea, was building islands and taking all my friends and family there, and like we could have our own little community type of thing. Um, and then when I was basically like 12, I think 13 maybe, basically up to 15, I was really into the idea of becoming an endocrinologist because of mm. the awesome endocrinologist I had. And then when I was 16, so this would have been last year, um, kind of realized after failing chemistry that maybe medicine was not for me. So um, I took a government class that I loved and I've always had a love of politics and that sort of stuff. So now I'm kind of focused on getting into international relations and politics. Well, I mean, at least you're doing the famous part well right now. <laughs> um, so you went through different, you know, four to five different stages, but you're kind of like on the liberal side at the moment. Can you explain why you decided to step on this stage? There are certain age groups that probably should not be making life altering decisions like three to four year olds. Absolutely not. But it does ultimately, I do think parents do need to be involved with mm -hmm. that just because parents do oftentimes have their best children, their children's best interests at heart, even if at times to the public or to the child, it seems unfair. So. I agree, but 
maybe just a little less with the conservative side this time. People also have said that you don't even develop your prefrontal cortex until you're 25. You know, I'm, I'm 26 and I feel like I can probably resonate <laughs> with that. I think the conservative side kept bringing up how there's certain things that you can't do, like in certain age groups. I think they're talking about like um, joining the military, uh, drinking, but in Europe you can drink at 16. Um, in the U.S., you can drive at 16, but in other countries, Middle Eastern and European, you can't drive till 18. So how do we determine, like, in actuality, what the limits are? Do you guys have any thoughts amongst you, you two of uh, what made you guys go to the conservative side? I'd love to hear a discussion between you two. The one thing that really resonated with me is, is we're talking, I think he said, we're talking about kids who, people who still believe in make-beliefs. I just don't think they understand the gravity of the situation. Maybe not just transitioning, but there's certain decisions that they don't understand the gravity of. I would push back a little. I think, like, especially when it comes to teenagers, I would say, like, 15, 16, I would say high school range. I think, like, we should probably give them a little bit more credit. I think, you know, when it comes to something like that, I mean, I would say, like, I think it's, of course, you know what I mean? We're talking about minor. It's a huge range. But I think... Yeah. We should, in general, give a little bit more credit where it's due to them. I yeah. will say, the reason I'm here is because I think I just agree fundamentally with the idea, like, making life-altering choices. I don't think, mm -hmm. you know, anyone under the age of 18, I guess, maybe might be arbitrary, but, you know, in that minor range, as we've defined it in this country, I would agree. I don't think, you know, life-altering, whether that's a medical transition or even something like, you know, like, what school you go to, like, what college. I mean, you know, minors make decisions like that all the time, but they're not most of the time, and I would hope, Usually they're not, you know, completely on their own. You know, we have support systems. And I think mm -hmm. what's really important is that we extend those support systems. So like counseling and, you know, people at schools and, you know, educating parents so that students aren't going into decisions completely on their own. Minors should be allowed to medically transition. Absolutely not. That has not changed for me. We're talking about mental health issues. And there are a whole host of problems that children deal with when they're struggling with identity or gender dysphoria. Let's treat those issues, let's treat those causes. I have mentioned numerous cases of former, former trans kids who were pushed into it, parents who tried to protect their kids and were punished for doing so. This is a very fraught affair. This, these are irreversible, damaging procedures and we have so many detransitioners that are coming out warning the next generation not to do this. I think it's worth mentioning that the detransitioners, while I do sympathize with them and I think it's unfortunate that the medical system has failed them. They're a statistical anomaly in the grand scheme of how many people have transitioned medically and surgically. That's, we don't know that though. So the issue is we don't know what the detransition rate really is simply because they're falling off the rolls. If you don't have your primary sex organs removed, then you can literally stop taking hormones and nobody's following up on them. Also, we also know that the, uh, the longest study out is the five-year study and the average detransition takes place four to 10 years after. And so those people are not being counted in those studies. I think that we should be working on mental health coverage. We should be getting them to an age of, a, age of adulthood. Um, we shouldn't be mutilating them um, as at a young age. And, and, and I think that they, like he said, like your prefrontal cortex is where you make impulse decision making. And so that's what develops last. And so we should be getting them there. I think we can look at social transition Social transition might not be a zero-sum game because we see that it kind of generally leads to transition. But let them socially transition, get them to adulthood, and see where we're at. I agree. Let them socially transition, use hormone blockers, start cross hormones at an appropriate age when the body is ready to be receiving cross hormones later on. I also agree that we shouldn't be mutilating children. I don't believe anyone's being <coughs> mutilated, but surgery doesn't have to happen before 18 if they are already being treated with cross hormones or hormone blockers. And we can wait until they're 18 if we are helping them and affirming their gender. I don't believe anybody has an agenda of chopping children up. Yeah, I would just say ultimately those who are promoting this and those who are accepting it will be accountable. We're seeing a lot of different lawsuits coming out. Uh, there's a transgender, or detransitioner who is now suing Kaiser Permanente up in, um, in like San Jose area because she felt like she, um, she, he, I don't even know what gender they are, but um, they felt like they were um, led into this. They were, they were tricked. They were kind of ran into that system and now they're suing. And you're going to see a lot of rise of these lawsuits. And so just to finish, I would say that um, children are too young to transition. Uh, they can't fully grasp this concept. And then also it's just not true. And so we shouldn't be pushing it for kids. And I think the solution to this is 
accepting who you actually are, accepting your actual body, going through therapy, and you know, I'm a Christian, seeking the gospel, letting, let, we're made in God's image and likeness, and so allowing God to speak into that through prayer and sacraments, and yes. I get the argument of, you know, you're not developed until you're 25, but if that's the case, then people shouldn't be experiencing anxiety and so on at 26, if that's gonna be like the main point of argument. Like, you know, I started paying bills and working at 15, 16, put myself through school. I bought my first car, 16, but my, my second car, my third car all on my own. And I wish somebody at that time had looked at me and told me that I wasn't allowed to be making specific decisions for myself because you know I think that's on a person to person basis and I completely agree with you that if they're at that time they're ready for that then they're ready for it and if they're not they're not so now let's see the final decision from the undecided group now undecided what's your final decision So what's been great about this video is that a lot of you guys have switched different spectrums. So let's start out with what made you go to the liberal side. Um, I think that you made some really good points um, about being able to um, start puberty blockers and socially transition. And like surgeries do not need to happen before 18. They can happen after, but as long as the person can decide to start puberty blockers and decide to socially transition because what if they don't make it to 25? What if they're not still alive to transition at 25 when they're fully developed? So like, I just don't, um, sorry. And like, I seen my cousin that I mentioned, um, I, I just, I can't imagine my life without them. And if they were not, like, if they're not able to transition, um, I know the effect that will have on their life and I just, I can't imagine it. I think for me, what made me come to the conservative side is I definitely think that social transitioning is acceptable. Um, I think of the case of like Angelina Jolie's um, daughter who went through a long, long phase of, I guess, we are not entirely sure if it was gender dysphoria or not, but wanted to present as male and then came to an age when they did decide that that was something they no longer wanted to do. And so I, I really respect that opinion and I am also concerned about that I really genuinely we also if we're not entirely sure like what the medical you know transitioning has long-term effects or like the medicine itself on the brain development and all that stuff I think we should just be very wary of letting children transition even if it is with um, medical you know teams because as you said earlier science is constantly a changing field I still lean very much towards the middle, but I think if I had to pick, I lean right now a little bit more on the conservative side. And I think I think the point you made about how we just don't know really like the detransition rate. Transitioning is a process, you know, medical transition, also a social transition, and you're absolutely right, you know, in 10 years from now, you know, someone's experience might not be the exact same. I'm not saying that that's the case for everyone. I'm saying that that's probably still not even the majority of people, but I do think it's still a significant amount to, to take into consideration. There's still a lot that maybe we just don't fully understand. And I think until we get to that point, I'll just err on the side of caution, at least that's how I see it. Clearly we all have our own biases and hopefully we can consider all these different personal experiences as well as statistics. So thank you.